So I have no problem when it comes to profiling on a personal level. Um, my problem is when we discover that that guy in the hoodie is no danger and he's actually a nice guy who's a little bit lost and he, he asked you for directions and you helped him out. If you continued with the negative thought, even though you know more information about this person, then that's, that's where the problem comes into play. Adam, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, so you are an author, you're a podcaster, you're originally an IT professional, you're a father, and you're the owner of Wrong Speak Publishing. Uh, for anyone that might not be familiar with you, anything else you'd want to add to that? Uh, <laughs> ambassador for XXXY uh, Athletics. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure there's other other things. I try to do, I, I don't say no often, so I try to do as much as I possibly can. Awesome. Uh, well, part of what we'll be talking today about is your book, uh, Black Victim to Black Victor. Really enjoyed it. Uh, to be completely honest, uh, leading up to the interview, I had reservations about following through with the interview just because I'm, I'm an allegedly white person. And <laughs> it's like taboo to talk about race. Uh, your book got me thinking more about race than I probably ever have before, mm. um, just generally. So uh, it really got my mind thinking a lot about it. But yeah, I, I wanted to go through with the interview, first of all, because you seem like a very genuine person. I really enjoyed reading your book. And second, I, whenever I have fear like that, I feel like fear can be either something telling you that you're about to do something really stupid or telling you to do something that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge and, you know, an obstacle that you have to overcome. So I, I took it as the latter and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'm right, but... Um, I yeah. don't think I'll say anything too stupid, although I feel like, you know, as an allegedly white person, you have to walk on eggshells around the conversation. I, I would like to know, how has the reception been to your book in general? Like, because um, you do, you're very critical of what is, I guess, considered black culture by some people. You are mm -hmm. critical of it. I, have you gotten a lot of pushback on that or uh, how's the reception been? You know, it's interesting, uh, just in general, when it comes to criticisms, I generally don't read the comments. I do very superficial takes as to what people think. Uh, the stuff that I take into account is when people reach out to me personally. Hmm. Um, you know, so if they send me emails, if they send me DMs, things of that nature, the people who don't like what I have to say just in general have nothing usually it's nothing of substance to be critical of what I say. Uh, it's usually just some sort of insult. Um, and no one has ever sent me an insult and actually read my book. No, hmm. no one's like, I read your book and it pissed me off. This chapter, you said this and that. Like no one's actually sent me anything like that. Um, so as far as I know, uh, there is no pushback. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for my own sanity. Uh, I just, I, I typically don't seek, seek out that stuff. Um, I expect that there are people who are not going to agree. I know I have family members who don't agree uh, with some of the things that I say, uh, but they still respect me and they still love me. Um, and I, I believe I, even in the book, you know, I, I basically just try to frame it as um, I don't expect people to read this and agree with everything that I'm saying, but at least yeah. understand where I'm coming from. Um, and I think, that's ultimately the point. The point is to, hey, read this, think about it, discard it if you don't think it's valid or whatever, and we just move on from there. Um, and, and just being perfectly honest, you know, I, I wrote the book in, um, in 2020, or starting in 2020. I published it in 2021. And there are certain things that I've evolved on in, in that period yeah. of time. So, um, not to say I would disagree if I was to rewrite it, I would change certain things maybe or elaborate more in these area in this particular area. Um, so, you know, people evolve and, and we have even slightly different viewpoints and things like that, even with my old self. So, um, you know, when it comes to negative reception and stuff like that, I really don't care. I do care when people personally reach out to me 
uh, and tell me how my book impacted them or uh, thanking me or, you know, things like that. Overwhelmingly, the people who actually read the book um, understand where I'm coming from. That's the only yeah. thing I really cared about. Um, at minimum, understand where I'm coming from. And if you don't agree, at least you, you, you disagree in good faith. I didn't want the book to come across um, as being, you know, wagging my finger or um, saying the shocking thing. Um, and I actually didn't even want the book to seem like a political book. Hmm. Um, like this is a black conservative take on blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I tried to write it my best not to seem political, not to see like Adam, some Republican or, or anything like that, which I'm not. Um, but just take what I'm saying from my life experience, from what I've seen, um, my concepts, my interpretations as a human being. And that's it. And if you disagree, that's cool. If you agree, yeah. that's also cool. Yeah. And I thought it was a really interesting book. You covered a lot in it. Uh, like I was telling you before we uh, started recording, like it's about 270 pages. And I, I feel like you went over so many different things in those 270 pages. So it was pretty remarkable in that regard. Usually yeah. like you read a 300 or more page book and you start to see a lot of redundancy. And yeah. I didn't really see that in your book. You really just, you, you covered things, hit it hard where you like in the things that you covered, you like went into detail and then you mm -hmm. moved on to something else. Like it was very comprehensive in that regard. Thank you. And, and you know, throughout the editing process, uh, you know, I started with a certain amount of chapters and I added to it and then I got rid of stuff or I combined things because um, just in my, so people understand the book was my, really my first writing project. Um, I never wrote, uh, outside of like going on forums and stuff like that. Um, I never attempted to do anything sort of like an article, a long form, um, for public consumption in this particular manner. Um, and so, you know, I have, I had an inexperience as far as doing that, but I have lots of experience as far as communication. So my entire work career has been revolving around um, helping people, whether it be tech support. Uh, my first job, I, I worked for an alarm company um, over the phone, uh, you know, call center type work, uh, dispatching police and things like that. Um, and especially when you talk to the general public, you learn how to communicate with people. Uh, and, and especially doing like over the phone tech support you have to communicate with people in a way that they understand hmm. to get them to do the thing. And, and so I could be talking to an old lady who knows nothing about technology, but I have to speak it, speak in a way that she understands and be direct with her in that way. Um, and so you learn a lot about language. If you care about your job, at least um, no. <laughs> you, you learn a lot about language. You learn that if I say this, it calms the situation. If I say this, um, it gets the person to come on my side so we can work together to accomplish something. So you, you really learn a lot of communication skills, especially doing over the phone support. All you have is your ear and you have to listen to everything that someone says. So I probably annoy the shit out of my wife, but like she'll say something and she'll say a word. And I'm like, but you said this word, why did you say that word? And I'll, <laughs> I'll like hyper-focus on that one word yeah. because to me, that one word matters the most out of the entire sentence that you just stated. Um, and so with my writing style and, it, and it's gotten better since I wrote the book, but with my writing style, I'm very particular on the words that I use. I'm very particular that this word can be misinterpreted. So I'm not going to use that word. I'm going to change it, but I'm also going to be straight to the point. Uh, I'm not going to try to fluff it because the point is I'm trying to communicate with you as to how I feel and telling you in 85 different ways, the same thing is going to bore you to death. Yeah. But if I tell you in a few different ways, so you can understand my point and we move on to the next thing, you'll, you'll take it in. Um, so it, to me, it's the difference between someone who is trying to communicate with someone 
and the difference between someone who's trying to sound smart. Um, and I believe a good communicator is actually someone who is smart. Um, someone who is trying to sound smart uh, tends to be someone who's insecure about themselves um, and just uses a whole bunch of language and fills up an entire book of, of nonsense and you come away with it, nothing. Whereas I've had people come away with understanding something and thinking about something and it inspires a thought. Um, and that's all because I was really careful about what I said, how I did it, not being repetitive. And I wanted to make sure people understood that I want you to think about this in this moment, take that in, let's move to the next moment, take this in. I want to use, uh, there's a lot of storytelling throughout the book. And that's one thing that's become part of my writing style is I tell a lot of stories, whether it be my personal story um, in some fashion or some life lesson that I've learned. But storytelling is it's like the oldest thing to do, but it conveys a message. And every chapter has a story. Um, there's a couple chapters, I believe, one or two chapters where it's like a fictional story. It's clearly fictional, but I'm just giving you a visual illustration. It's another way for someone to kind of to see what I'm talking about. And then they remember that because they can remember the story that I and and they can take that with them moving forward. Um, so there are very particular things that I tried to do throughout the book. Lots of storytelling, lots of personal stories. Um, because stories are memorable. Um, whereas if I just say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, um, you'll forget half of it. But if I lace it in with a story, uh, then it becomes something that you can you can easily remember. Yeah. Yeah, the storytelling, it is interesting how much more a story will resonate than just giving the information. And I'm with you with words. I try to pay close attention to the words I'm using because some words can be interpreted very different ways by different people. Right. And I do the same thing in conversations where I'll, I'll, I'll kind of latch onto a word. Usually when I'm taking notes during an interview, it's just a word. It's like, it's mm -hmm. one word that I, stands out that either I want to dive into that word or that word will remind me of kind of what was being talked about. So I'm, I'm very big into the linguistic aspect and I agree with yeah. you. I don't think you have to be, have a huge vocabulary to convey a message. And I actually think not dumbing your speech down, but like using more generally known language is beneficial because if you could be explaining things very clearly, but if you're using big words that nobody understands, you're talking to people that probably already understand the concepts or, or maybe even beyond the concepts. So right. you have to, have language that appeals to more people. Not everyone has a huge vocabulary. It yeah. kind of reminds me in the book, you talk about uh, a few black leaders and um, well, you put leaders in quotes, which I actually like because uh, <laughs> we'll talk about language a bit in this interview, because I have a problem with a few ways that race and things are talked about in general. And I'm yeah. sure we have some overlap there, but you talk about, uh, Michael Eric Dyson a little bit in the book. And I remember watching an interview with him and Jordan Peterson and you captured it really well in the book. Cause I'm listening to this interview. I'm like, he sounds really good with what he's saying, but he's not actually saying anything. Like he's making right. these arguments and using these really big words and kind of this, uh, I don't know, poetic kind of language, but he wasn't actually conveying anything. It was, it was like really big words that delivered no real message if you knew what all the words meant. Um, mm -hmm. Why is that? Why do you think people like him use that kind of language that and speak that way? Oh, because it works. It intimidates people. Um, there, There is a segment of population that is easily intimidated because of language. Um, whether it be, you know, he's this professor at this college, he's an academic, and, you know, I work at the store down the street. Who am I in comparison intellectually to this guy? Um, and so when someone whips out, uh, you know, vocabulary that you have to dig deep into the dictionary to see what the meaning is, um, they must be saying something impressive, you know? 
And what I've become very attuned to, especially since writing the book, uh, because I've been more involved in the media, I've been more in tune to <laughs> babble, uh, academic mm. babble, um, where you sit there and you said, uh-huh, you said absolutely nothing to me and you think I'm stupid. Um, and the only stupid person here is actually you because you have no idea what you're trying to convey. You have no idea what you're even talking about. No. Um, Michael Dyson, he's, he's really good at it. I'll give him that. He's very talented at it and it works often. Um, it's just when someone finally calls him out on it that you can see, you know, beyond the veil as to what he is actually trying to do. He's using language and a manipulative tactic to make it appear as he is one, um, an expert as to whatever topic that he's talking about. And two, to intimidate the listener and to succumb to the expert as he must be the expert. Do you hear how he's explaining this? Uh, mm. You know, I didn't catch on to what he's saying because I'm just not smart enough. That's how, that's how crazy this guy must be uh, intellectually. Um, and so when you, when you don't have that uh, intimidation for the academics in our society, when you, when you, when you trust your instinct and just listen to what the person is saying, um, then you start to realize, oh, this person is not actually saying anything. And if he is mm -hmm. saying something, he could say it and it's in a way that is far clearer than he actually is. And he's choosing to speak like this. Yeah. And so the, the question for me is, why is he choosing to speak like this? So either one, they don't know what they're actually trying to convey. And so they're just using a whole bunch of words um, to convey some confusing message that they don't even understand. Or two, um, they just want to sound smarter. Um, mm. And to them, they value appearing smart rather than giving a clear message for the audience to interpret that this person is very intelligent. And, you know, uh, when people, whether it's a writing that I had or like an article or even from the book, I, I write in a very balanced way, in a very clear way. Um, and I use very particular vocabulary and I do all that very purposefully. And the comment that I get, that's a, this, the biggest compliment that I can receive is they say, it's very easy for me to interpret what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And it flows, there's a balance to it. And I was like, yes, because I'm trying to convey a point. I want you to understand the point that I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to hide behind, uh, you know, uh, illusionary words and stuff like that and, and intimidate you. I want you to see I'm relating to you and I'm speaking in a, in a common language um, in a slightly above common language so that uh, you can understand what I'm telling you. And then yeah. if you think I'm smart because of the point I'm making, then that's up to you. And so that's, I think that's the difference. Um, we have a lot of people who just kind of succumb to the, to the, to the vocabulary. You can memorize words. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes, and not sometimes, all the time, we take someone who can get this uh, high academic score and, and these tests and they do all these things. And we think that this person is wildly intelligent when the reality is that they could just memorize stuff. This is the memorization portion. Yeah. The, compl the complex stuff, the ability to decipher things, the ability to uh, construct things, deconstruct, um, to problem solve, to troubleshoot, you know, I, you know, which I spent most of my career doing is troubleshooting. That takes far more work to actually do. And I see people in the IT field who are given like, well, you do step one, then step two and step three. And if step three doesn't work, well, then you go to step four. And if none of that stuff works, they have no idea what to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whereas for me, 
I have to know the concepts. I have to know how everything works. Then you give me the problem and I can decipher based on the problem that you're having, here are the possible issues that we're facing. Let's attack what's the most likely uh, culprit for the problem. So you have to troubleshoot. And for me, when I talk about social issues and things like that, part of it is me troubleshooting. I'm just analyzing what the issue is and I'm troubleshooting it. Um, and so for me, often like talking about politics and culture is not personal. Um, it's just analytics. It's just deciphering what the problem is, troubleshooting it and saying, well, here's the likely solution to this because I know how these things work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like we're pretty similar in that regard. Like when I can talk politics and I don't care if the person I'm talking to disagrees with me or not, it doesn't matter yeah. because I, I see it as I'm just trying to get to the truth get to the bottom of reality, understand the world a bit better. And if somebody challenges me, it's like, cool, you're giving me something else to think about. Maybe I don't have to accept what you say, but I can at least either sharpen what I'm thinking or, or what my position is or adapt mm -hmm. a little bit and, and understand yours and, and incorporate that into what I'm believing or what I think about a situation because it's complex and yeah. I actually wish more people were into politics, not like into it, like a sporting thing, like, like a lot of people <laughs> treat it, but more yeah. into it, like paid attention to it because it's the one thing, like you can opt out of a political conversation, but you can't opt out of the consequences of it, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the sport is what I'm against. Yeah. Um, and I think there's, there's one point where it was a little bit of a sport for me. Um, but also, I, I do believe that I fell for some of the manipulation uh, of politics. The uh, This is the last election. This is the most important election. If you don't vote for me, the, the country is over, uh, which is a bipartisan statement. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, especially like in the past four years, I've been very attuned to manipulation. Words that are very manipulative. Um, and, and I reject it wholeheartedly when I hear uh, emotional manipulation. We, we could talk about race, where you're supposed to vote for Kamala if you're a Black person, right? Why wouldn't you vote? Are you a real Black person? Like, it's that kind of uh, emotional manipulation to get you to do something when in reality, they're using manipulation because there must not be much substance there. Hmm. And, and so I have to ask a question, if there's not much substance, why am I putting so much emphasis behind this person? Why am I pushing this person with no substance into power? What, cause they sort of resemble my skin tone. That's the reason why I should give them power. Um, like when you start to break it down, it doesn't make much sense to me. Um, so there's a lot of affinity that happens um, and it's not necessarily it's a right wing thing or a left wing thing. It's just that people do the thing that works. Manipulation works in politics. Um, if you can convince a bunch of people that if Kamala uh, becomes the president, the country is over and that works to get them to vote, then that that's what they'll do. They'll, they'll use manipulation tactics. I prefer not to manipulate people. Um, I don't I don't lie to people uh, to get them to see my point. Uh, I don't need to lie. The truth should be it. I've made the point, you know, someone can hate Trump and that's fine. You don't have to like Trump. Um, and you cannot vote for him, but you don't have to lie about him. Like there are certain things that are just true. And if he's so terrible, then the truth is enough. No. But when you make up something about him or spread a lie about him that is verifiable as a lie. So it's not like, oh, you must be lying. Like I can, I can literally look and see that you're lying. There's proof here. And you keep that going, going. It makes me question, well, is that person that terrible if you have to make oh. up a lie um, and, and keep spreading it and keep spreading it? You know, I've used the extreme example of Hitler. We don't really make up lies about Hitler because <laughs> the truth is no. bad enough. <laughs> But if we had to make up lies about Hitler to make him appear like the bad guy, then you could see like, well, maybe he's not that bad of a person if we have to lie about him. Um, so the truth, it should be enough 
uh, to get people to do the thing that you want them to do, if it's the right thing to do. Um, or if it just like, I believe giving people honest information um, and let them choose for themselves, but we don't have yeah. to lie and manipulate people. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the good people on both sides thing is one of the most blatant that was said again in the debate that just barely happened. And it's like, that's, it's verifiable that you can go back and listen to the whole thing and hear him s condemn uh, the white supremacists and neo-Nazis. But, right. you know, they're still repeating that stuff. Seven years later, it's like, why? I mean, and you can't, you can't chalk that up to, oh, Kamala and or Biden, whoever saying it didn't know it because by now, anyone who's in the political arena at all should know the full context of that, in my opinion. Yeah. But when it when it comes to manipulation, do you feel like race is especially uh, it, it's easier to manipulate based on race than other things? Because we're dealing with a social construct here, like, yeah. You can look at people, you can look at somebody and say, oh, they're black and oh, they're white, but then you can find mixed race people or people who don't quite line up with what you expect and they might be harder to identify. And there's a lot with that. Like there's no authority, like Kamala's uh, race being questioned. I, I don't agree with her race being questioned, but it does bring up an interesting thing. And in, like, there's no authority in this. There's no one that you can go to and be like, Hey, tell us absolutely what race she is or anything like that. And mm -hmm. if it's just the individual that determines it, then it's also kind of meaningless in a sense too, because <laughs> what's to, what, I mean, people can lie, right? But yeah. I mean, there's no way to find a specific represent representative for a race of people because it's even hard to define who all is of any uh, is black or white or Hispanic, Asian. It's very difficult to determine who is in those categories in an absolute manner. So yeah. is it is race just easier to manipulate in general, in your opinion? Yeah, very much so. Um, and it's it's easier to manipulate because there are a lot of people who attach their identity to race. Um, and in, in some ways, I understand you know, if we're talking about Black Americans, I understand the historical context behind race and identifying with race as far as um, the the history of slavery, um, where their identity was kind of taken away, and the yeah. only form of unity that that they had, so to speak, as far as like group classification, was race, um, where they may be. Uh, people of an African ancestry from different parts of Africa uh, who had no real shared common value. And now they're in a different country and generations go by and all they know is that the people that look like them are treated this particular way. Um, and that the only way for them to have some sort of commonality is to build a cultural framework around race. So the way I kind of see it, uh, and this was something that I I understood I understood in a slightly different way after writing the book. Um, so I don't really dive into it within the book, but it makes sense to me. Um, for many Black people, it is not about the skin color, but it's about the cultural reference. It's much in the same way if someone says, I'm Italian. We understand, well, when they say I'm Italian, there is a cultural reference. Uh, there's maybe a food reference, uh, a language reference, but there's a, a, like an entire framework around being Italian. For a lot of Black Americans, being Black is the being Italian. It's the, it's the cultural piece. Hmm. There's Black movies. There is um, Black lexicon. Uh, as far as language, there is a, a black culture as far as how dress and uh, how we carry ourselves, um, hairstyle, you know. So there's an entire cultural, um, a cultural framework built around being black because of the absence of, uh, of, of an external nation identity, 
So for, for everybody else, you know, I have friends who are immigrants um, from all different parts of the world. Uh, and especially in the United States, where it's a little bit unique versus if you go to other countries, it, it's less common. But here, it's it's like every other person you talk to, oh, my mother, my father, my grandparents, they're from somewhere else. Hmm. And so there is that uh, dual identity that they might have or a foreign country reference point that they have. But for many Black Americans, they don't have that. They They have... They're an American, but not just an American. They, there's a there's a cultural framework that that's been kind of um, harnessed here. So I do think that there, I think there are people who don't fully understand that, and understandably so. That when someone is when someone who is black is talking about something, you know, when they say black people. One person is thinking someone who has my skin color. Mm. The other person is thinking culturally. Yeah. And and there and it depends on who's hearing it to hear to kind of understand the distinction between the two. Um and even for myself, I never really even thought of it that way until having conversations with people and I was like, yeah, that actually you're right. You're right about that. Um so on the flip side, it's very weird what's been happening in the past four years or so with people saying we want white people to see themselves as white, as like their identity marker that they should always reference. And that's weird to me because, you know, I've lived in five states throughout my life, interacting with people from, uh, you know, rural suburb the suburban and um and, and and urban and the people who i would say are white because i just don't i don't know who they are or anything but i would just say racially they are white if you were to ask them what are you they would say i'm italian i'm half this i'm that they would give me some sort of you know external location but they would never say i'm white that that would so it's it's very weird to me to hear far leftist ideology completely discarding all of that stuff to assimilate everyone who has your color skin tone as just being white. That's it. Absence of everything else. Um, it doesn't matter if your parents are Czech, uh, German, or anything. Guess what? They're all white. All the same. It just erases all that stuff. Um, so it's it's very, very strange when I hear stuff like that. And it's very worrying when people buy into it on both sides. Because um, yeah. I'm seeing white affinity on the left and the right. Um, and that's very worrisome. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think there's... A I heard uh, Ruthyard Lynch, I, I hope I pronounce his name right. Uh, he has a YouTube channel. I can't remember the name, but Chris Williamson interviewed him recently. And he said uh, the right basically only exists as w like an antithesis of the left to some degree. Like it doesn't have yeah. an identity. It's just kind of against the left to some degree, which is needed. I mean, you even touch on this in the book, like there has to be a right and a left or at least like opposite ends of whatever the spectrum is so that like there's healthy debate and, you know, common ground found, like you can't have either one of them dominate politics at all. But right. I do see that like people on the right, I, I assume they're on the right. I don't know for sure, but you know, you can kind of tell with some of the rhetoric that they, they spew it. And yeah, like there'll be people who are, you know, take pride in being white to an absurd degree. And I, you know, as an allegedly white person, I've never, first of all, I never even, I don't remember the first time I ever thought of the concept of me being white. Mm -hmm. And second of all, like white pride or, you know, anything like that is just kind of, it's, it doesn't even make sense to me. And like you said, it's like, I'm half Italian. I have some German, I have some English, some other stuff. I'm a little bit of a, 
uh, mix there in a bunch of European countries. And like, that's yeah. how I would identify. It's not really like, Oh, white, you know, like it's, I, I don't see everyone. I don't even, I, I don't like to assume anyone's race. I mean, like it, I feel like when you, we use these or people use these labels to act as if they know more about a person without actually getting to know anyone. Like if somebody's yes. like, Hey, somebody's coming over tonight. And I say, okay, cool. And like, it's a black guy. Like, that doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me if they wear glasses or they don't wear glasses, if they're going to be dressed nice or kind of sloppy, if they're a nice person or a mean person, it right. literally tells me nothing about the person, but we use these identifiers like they mean more than they do. I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, it might tell you that they like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure this chicken knows. Everybody likes chicken. Um, Everybody. <laughs> except vegans. Uh, except vegans, which. Actually, they do vegans. too, because they're, I mean, vegans and vegetarians always want their food to taste like uh, meat, which is a little funny. Yeah. But they're they're chicken meat. eaters in denial. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, you're, you're right. I think there is, there is a lot of presumption based off of race. Um, and listen, I, I think that first impressions matter. Um, and I, I do think that we have to, as human beings, we have to assess things. So profiling people, I think is is a normal human thing that we do. Um, and it's often for our safety. So for example, if you see a black person who's walking down the street uh, at night, it's just you and this other person and he's walking in your direction. Um, if he's wearing a suit, you might feel a different way versus if he had cornrows in his hair and he was wearing a hoodie and he's not making eye contact with you, that would make you feel unsettled. But if he's wearing a suit, nice suit, nice shoes, you're not worried. Why? Because how he's carrying himself is different. These are two different people and how they're carrying themselves. And your first impression um, and how you're supposed to assess the situation, especially where there might be possible danger, um, that's what everyone does. Um, I'm friends with lots of women and people sometimes make fun of me and I sometimes do make fun of my female friends because they talk about vibes and things like that. But I know what they're talking about. They're talking about instincts hmm. and in assessing things because they're the weaker of the two sexes and they can't play around with safety. Like maybe guys might guys are more um, uh, take more risks than women. So if she is in a situation where she feels uncomfortable because this guy is doing something or he looks a particular way. She is making a superficial judgment. She doesn't know who that person is, but there's something about him and I need to get away. Um, you know, I, we make these type of judgments all the time, especially with people that we don't know. So I have no problem when it comes to profiling on a personal level. Um, my problem is when we discover that that guy in the hoodie is no danger and he's actually a nice guy who's a little bit lost and he, he asked you for directions and you helped him out. If you continued with the negative thought, even though you know more information about this person, then that's, that's where the problem comes into play. Um, my issue with bigotry in that particular way has always been that it's illogical. Um, and it, and it's, there's always the, the racial exception I, I, is what I call it. Um, where you'll talk to someone. I, I've, I've actually had conversations with the internet's a weird place. I've talked to people. I would, I would ca call them white supremacists. Um, and I have these conversations with them and I'm like, but what about this person? You know, Cause they're saying all, oh, all of them are this. And I'm like, well, I'm not like that. Well, you're the exception. I was like, well, so, okay, so then, then it's not all. So, so what is it? And so then they flip flop on 
on what their clarification because they know it's not all, but they have to pretend in their head that it is all. So is your problem that there are black criminals or is your problem that all black people are criminals? Or like, so which one is it? Um, Cause it sounds like you have an issue with criminals and you wouldn't yeah. care, but they're, they're, they're stuck on the racial identity as being the problem. It, it's all illogical. Um, so when I see stuff like this, um, the, the, the stuff with Israel um, and, and the treatment and how people talk about Jews um, is completely illogical. And there's so many situations where I hear someone saying something and I think to myself, swap Jew out with something else. You would never say that. Why? Because yeah. it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. Um, swap black out and put white. It doesn't make sense. Why? Because it's illogical. So it doesn't even matter the the noun that you use. It still doesn't make sense. Um, and, and just as far as like, you know, when people talk about Jews and there's like some grand conspiracy and, and all this other bullshit, I'm like, that's not how people interact. <laughs> like yeah. people, people don't conspire so easily, which is why I have a, I have a big issue when it comes to government conspiracies um, more often, I think people, if we use like COVID, for example, people presume that there was this big meeting, like, um, the world economic forum, they all got together and said, we're going to put in COVID and do all this other stuff. And, and that's, they got everybody on board who are, who's everybody. Uh, there's so many people, so many people, everybody that you don't even know, everyone got on board and just put this through and, and everybody was okay with it. And guess what? It worked out perfectly fine. And all the negative things that you thought could possibly happen, happened uh, because that's how they planned for it to happen. And what I try to point out to people is that most of the time, people are just reacting to what is going on. Um, the idea that everyone is in on the game and everyone knows exactly what to do, that it will result into this exact reaction and have this re exact outcome uh, is total nonsense to me, especially when people talk about politicians, which by the way, aren't often the smartest of people, nevertheless the most calculated people in the world. Um, the idea that they are, they're crafty enough and calculated enough to be part of this grand conspiracy to ensure that you lose your business, um, it, it sounds illogical to me. What's more likely is that, oh crap, there's this virus that's going on and politically my opponent is saying this, so I'm going to say the opposite thing. Um, hey, the person I'm running up against, uh, I'm going to be even stronger on lockdowns than they are, right? To show my strength. Like they're, that's what politicians do. They, they're, they're reactionary more so than uh, planning stuff. But um I probably like ranting a little bit, but <laughs> no, no, you're good. I, I agree. I mean, I knew people who thought that the COVID uh, vaccines and, and there were things that like ended up being true with the vaccines in that they yeah. were rushed and, and they weren't properly tested fully, but that was just obvious from the get go. You can't, you can't test long-term side effects of a vaccine in six months because of simple math and logistics, you know, right. but yeah, you know, the conspiracy that I would tell people, and it's not really a conspiracy, it just, I, I would tell people, I, I just think people are taking advantage of the situation, like the CEOs of these pharmaceutical companies, they see it as like, an all like a great cash grab. And, and I think that's pretty much true. Like, oh yeah, because if you can push through a vaccine without really testing it fully, and getting an emergency authorization, and then uh, giving, getting immunity from any liability for it, yeah, of course you're going to push it on people and and not worry about the side effects because you have no accountability for it. But that's not even, I suppose that's a conspiracy to some degree, but it, it's mostly just a conspiracy of greed, which is common in in politics and the the government corporation relationship that we see so often. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm on board with that. Yeah, but, I think I would call them opportunists. Yeah whether it's a good opportunity or a bad opportunity, but it's just someone who says, Hey, listen, there's an opportunity here. Uh, big pharma already has 
their tentacles into government, right? They mm-hmm. have lobbyists in DC. Uh, they have connections. Like they have people who specifically um, lobby for their for their um, endeavors. So like it's already in place. Yeah. And so it's like, hey, listen, you got this virus going on. We're a pharmaceutical company. You want us to do it? We'll we'll do a rush, but we need some assurances. Yeah, we need to do something because politically this does not look good. We need to get control. There's a lot of panicking going on. And the sooner we get vaccines, the sooner, you know, we can get back to normal. Sure. We certainly make sure we can't be sued. <laughs> you know, so like that's an opportunist. That's not someone who's um, in one week the virus is going to hit and then the president's going to reach out to us and we're going to have this plan like. That's the conspiracy. That's when people are, yeah. they're making it seem like they're planning to do these things. Um, and I don't think it's a conspiracy when someone takes advantage of an opportunity placed in front of them. Yeah. Do you think there could be, would this be conspiracy or what? But do you think people, politicians uh, specifically, hide their intentions often? Because like on the De- in the Democratic Party, and I think some people on the right even too, or in the mm-hmm. Republican Party, there is more Marxism than meets the eye often. Like if you look deeper, it's like, oh, this person's father was a Marxist. This person's father was a Marxist has translated, uh, like Pete Buttigieg's father translated uh, uh, Antonio Gamchi's prison notebooks. Like he was mm-hmm. the father of cultural Marxism. And there's other people with parents who are Marxist. Not to say that your parents necessarily like you're going to be exactly what your parents are but right more than likely they influence you to some degree so there you know there could be some overlap there and do you think people hide their intentions like maybe are much more favorable to marxism or something or communism whatever you want to call it and don't want to reveal that because ideology ideologues do operate a little bit differently than normal people i guess like for lack of better words so I think I think there are different categories of these types of people, but I, I I do think that it is very likely that there are there are politicians who say Marxist things and believe Marxist things, but don't realize that it's Marxist. Mm. Like it's just it's just what they know. It's just what they've been around. Um, and I do know for a fact that there are politicians who say Marxist things to, to appease a particular audience, a voter, but they do not believe the thing that they're saying. Hmm. Um, and, and I know that firsthand, not firsthand, let me rephrase that. I know that because I know people who've been in the room and who have heard <laughs> uh, one, one particular politician I'm thinking of say, we have to put this out there. You know, I don't believe that though, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just like, so there, there is that. There's politics is gamesmanship. Um, and so I've become, once again, very attuned to the people who are ideologues and the people who just give ideologues lip service. And one of my complaints, you know, as a former Democrat, one of my complaints um, and one of the reasons why I no longer associate myself as a Democrat and now as an independent, I saw the weakness of Democrat politicians who, you know, you call them blue dog Democrats. They were predictable. You know, they they had for many, many years, they stood on this particular thing. And then I start hearing them say Marxist stuff. And then I Mm -hmm. see them placating to the far left. And then I'm just like, wait a second. Then, then they're like F everybody and, and go towards the elites. And then I start looking at all these ideologues. They're all wealthy. <laughs> like mm. I, I was like, something's up here. Like yeah. this, this is not the same party that I thought I was associating with some time ago. And they've, it's become a party of elitists. I, and it's not to say the Republicans don't have some elitists. They definitely do. They're just of a different variety and they're, 
they're less uh, influential. Um, but these people have infiltrated the uh, the Democratic Party, and they've also convinced they they've convinced the politi- like one of the politicians I'm thinking of who, who you know, they've convinced them that they got to play the game a little bit when it comes to leftist ideology. Mm-hmm. Um, they they put staffers, uh, you know, they surround themselves with staffers who've been ingrained in leftist ideology as well. So they're surrounded by it. So when Joe Biden goes on television and says gender affirming care, I do not believe that Joe Biden is a leftist. I don't even think Joe Biden knows what gender affirming care actually means or looks like. That's just what they tell him to say. And he is doing it to placate to a particular audience. So, uh, you know, there's there's definitely I think more people need to have that distinction between someone who is an ideologue, who knows exactly what they're saying, who does not hide that they're a socialist or a communist. Um, and then there are people who give lip service to the, the fringe of the Democratic Party because they're scared of them. Um, and they're scared of what they can do because they can organize. Yeah. Um, and they can raise money because a lot of them are wealthy. Um, so that, that always scares them as far as being able to win the next election, which they're always running. Yeah, the left is so far better at organizing than the right is from what I've yeah. seen. Um, why is it, in your opinion, that it the expectation is to vote Democrat if you're black? Because I listened to a space that was, um, I, I don't know how to phrase this properly, but it was, I guess, a black space. And it was like mm-hmm. Demo- black Democrats. And they were talking, a Republican guy did get up on stage for a little bit. And this was on X and he basically got shut down pretty quick, but you know, they were talking about the racist things that Republicans have done. And I just found it interesting because the Republic Republicans have done racist things. I can't remember the person who spearheaded it, but it was like this uh, movement. in I think the early 1900s to like silence black people within the party of the Republican mm-hmm. party. But if you go back, both parties have a tremendous amount of racism in their past. So why, why is it that one, like why I don't understand the argument there of like, Oh, this party is racist because they did this. It's like both of them have done racist stuff. So I don't understand that logic. So I'm wondering if you know anything about that. Um, All right. So the expectation that black Americans become Democrats or should always be Democrats. I think that is part of the culture as well. It's the cultural relevancy part. And the Democratic Party is the most familiar party for most Black Americans, politically speaking. Um, I've explained this before that 60% of Black Americans live in 10 states. Uh, So they live in very particular states in in or or around um, a high density urban areas. Um, so Illinois, for example, Chicago, they live in Chicago or in the surrounding Chicago areas. Um, uh, so when you think of Chicago, politically speaking, you think of Democrats, right? It's a Democrat stronghold. Um, and if I was to go through all these different places, you would see the same pattern. The familiarity is with the Democratic Party um, when it comes to politically speaking. Georgia, Atlanta, um, high uh, black population, Democrat stronghold of a city. So it's it's where stuff becomes so obviously normal and part of the culture. And any anytime someone deviates from what many think is part of the culture, then that's when they come after them. Um, now, I will say this. There is... Because of the because of the odd way black culture has morphed over over decades, there is this weird assimilation 
but it, it's not an organized assimilation. So what I mean by is you talk to 10 black people and you can ask them, um, are these things okay? And maybe most of them say yes, eight out of 10 say yes. But the two say, no, those things aren't okay. Those, those two people who say, those aren't things I would associate with black culture. The eight do. Well, who's to determine that it is, right? You know, so like in the example of the Italians, we know we can we can tell if something is of an Italian reference, uh, of an Italian hi history, a part of Italian culture to some respect. Maybe it's from a particular region. Like we can look the stuff up when it comes to things that we would call black culture. It's all personal. Mm. Yet we all pretend that it's not personal. Um, and so everyone is kind of like in this weird place where we think that we're all on the same page and we're not. Um, so it, it's very strange that we all think that we're on the same page and think that everyone, everyone agrees with, like I've, I've gotten into conversations with people where they're like, you've seen this movie, right? I was like, no, I've never seen it. Yo, you black, you've never seen that movie. I'm like, <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? It's very possible to not see this movie and be black. But it's, there is a level of like, it's so rigid for some people that in their head, they've constructed that every black person is exactly like them. And anyone who, and not just like them, but even like their circle and anyone who purposefully deviates from that. And it's not just, a lot of people don't understand. It's not just politics. Um, it's not just, oh, you're a Republican, you know, you're a coon, this and that. I've heard this about listening to different music. I've heard this if you date interracially, right? What does that have to do with black culture? Well, the, these, that's what I'm saying. Like all this stuff, um, it, there's a, there's a level of rigidness when it comes to the expectation for black people to be this image that someone else has constructed in their head that no one is on the same page about, but everyone thinks that they're on the same page about because there are enough overlaps where we kind of think that we're all on the same page, but there's nothing written. There's no real historical reference to kind of understand why we're saying the things that we're saying. Um, so like I could talk to somebody and like, do black people play guitars? Man, black people don't play guitars. Well, we have a whole history of black guitarists, yeah. <laughs> like we have <laughs> blues and all this other stuff. But you talk to this one person in their head, they're like, man, a real black person don't play guitars. And, it, it, and so that's what I'm saying. Like, is this person right or wrong? It doesn't sound like they're right to me, but in their head, they're right. So then it must be right. So when you get into these spaces, all it is, is gatekeeping. That's the best word I can use. There's racial gatekeeping that happens all the time. It is, you're not allowed to say this. You're not allowed to believe this. Get in line. Yeah. Because if you don't get in line, you're just as bad as the enemy. And whoever the enemy is to me, that you're just as bad. And so if I come on and, and give a varying viewpoint and I can clearly explain why I have this varying viewpoint, I must be a Trump supporter. I must be this. I must be that. I must hate myself. I must hate being black. I hate my mama. You know, you hear all of this shaming language that comes with it. Um, and to go back to what we talked about manipulation, they use the shaming language to get compliance, um, to get compliance out of you. And so when they don't, it, it really falls flat because you just laugh at them. Because it seems silly that you have adults telling other adults that they must change their behavior to make them feel comfortable. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's it's all silly, um, but there's there's a lot of it. There's a lot of people who think this way. Fortunately, there's a lot of people who just don't care. Um, like you know, hey, listen, is that what you want to do? That's what you want to do. And unfortunately, places like Twitter Spaces, you have the the worst of the ideologues, the people with the strongest opinions who are never wrong about anything. Um, that's where they go and that's where they flourish. 
Um, but really, it's just it's a cesspool uh, for them to get confirmation bias and give them an enemy and they'll go after them. Uh, one word that comes to mind, and it's a word that I I actually don't like as, as, I, as I've thought about this more and more is the word community. Uh, it's, not, <laughs> it's not just with race. This is with yeah, sexuality and all kinds of other things. The word community, the best definition I can come up with for what people actually mean when they use that word is political grouping. Um, mm -hmm. Because people want to talk about, oh, the black community wants this, or the Hispanic community wants this, or, or the LGBTQ community wants this. But like I already said earlier, and, and you touched on this, like you can't really find a representative for a group, like any of those groups, because there's no, you know, Hispanic voting for a leader. Like there, there is no like actual democratic process for choosing a representative. It's just uh, people purport to speak for a group and then you either accept it or reject it. And you have no idea if people outside of that group are influencing whether uh, the person purporting is accepted or rejected. So it's, it's pretty complicated, but it, it's, it doesn't mean anything. And it's really yeah. interesting because if you go outside and I've asked people this, like, well, what if you stop agreeing with the community? Are you no longer a part of the community? Are you, <laughs> are you banned just while you disagree and then accept it back when you agree with the community? Like, what are the rules? How do you determine what, like, if you're a part of the community, do you, it just seems like you lose your individuality when you get lumped up as a community. Would you kind of agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, and not even just that, but like, it, to me, it, it's the Wild West because, all right, so who gets to determine who's in the community? Who gets to determine when I'm being acceptable enough for the community? Um, and that's why I call them gatekeepers. And they're gatekeepers are, are self-anointed. Yeah. Um, and they have the gall to tell other adults what is acceptable and what isn't. Not about like breaking laws, but it's just about general behavior um, to fit in to this social construct of a group. Because it still is, there's culture built around it, but it's still a, a construct. Yeah. Um, and for this person that lives hundreds of miles away from me, never met me, to tell me that I can no longer associate with a group. I don't even know who you are. Nevertheless, take you as an authority figure to tell me that I am part of this group or not part of this group. Who fucking cares? Who asked you? Yeah. You know, so there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of weird and I think these people, when I say weird, I, I do genuinely think that these people are strange, uh, who are very vocal uh, and they're, you're not part of the group anymore. You know, it's just like, <laughs> I didn't ask to be yeah. part of it. I don't care who you are. Like, I'm still racially black. Ah, you know, you know, you can't say, you can't, you can't change my skin color. Um, but it's just like, I find it, I find it sad and amusing at the same time, because I can't imagine being someone who's built my identity around happenstance. Like you just happen to be born black. Yeah. That's all. Um, and so when you see people who build pride around it as well, and an entire identity um, where all of their behavior, their influences, the movies that they watch, all this stuff. And I've, I know people who are like this. And it's very strange to me that they will only entertain stuff that is black. They will only do the things that they know for sure that they can, they can go into any majority black area and say, I saw this, I did this, I experienced this, and everybody would be, um, would be perfectly comfortable with what they were doing. Um, my, my wife was on this Facebook group uh, 
you know, and she, she lurks in this one Facebook group and it was black women talking to each other. And one woman, I can't remember what the thing was, but she asked, do black people do this? And she was asking because she liked the thing. And I said, how fucking strange is that? Uh, an adult is asking other adults, is it okay if I do this thing? Only for the simple fact that they share similar complexion. That's mm -hmm. it. And I can't think of any other group. I'm friends with people of all different backgrounds. I can't think of any other group where someone would ask that question. You know, I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are gatekeepers in different ethnic backgrounds and stuff like that, but I don't think they're serious. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that they're very, very few. Um, you know, and I don't think people take them seriously either. There are people that they're in office. They're, they're, they have political power and people take them seriously and people listen to their jargon and their bull. And they think these people are, yes, of course, yes. And inevitably what happens with those people who are the loudest and the proudest to be black, they are always a hypocrite of the very thing that they talk about in some way. If you dig deep enough, you'll find it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the most obvious one the most obvious ones are the ones where super pro black, uh, you know, the black woman is this and, and you got, you love her and this and that, and everything is black. Everything is black. And then you see that their children are mixed. <laughs> it's just like, nah. what happened there? You know, and I'm for interracial racing, uh, uh, interracial dating. Like, I don't, I don't care. My son is mixed race. I, I don't care. But this person is mighty loud about how everything that is black is beautiful and, and touches is amazing. Uh, you know, <laughs> and then you can't even procreate with somebody who's of the very amazing thing that you claim to, you know, so it's that kind of hypocrisy. But once again, this is, I think this is still in the realm of bigotry because if I was talking about a white person who was talking about, how the white race is this magical thing that there is white girl magic, <laughs> you know, that white is amazing. White is beautiful. White is this. We would be like, you sound like a supremacist. Yeah. And these people are black supremacists that we're talking about in many ways. Um, the very thing that they say, they would never allow for someone of a different race to say the very thing that they're saying about themselves because they could see the supremacists if a white person says it, but they can't see the supremacists in themselves when they say it. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot of allowance in American culture for, for black supremacy to exist, to say supremacist things. And everybody just kind of shrugs their shoulders because they're like, all right, whatever. And they just move on. Um, or they're just like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing with victim narratives where every black person gets to, to claim that they're oppressed without any evidence and they're allowed to take on someone else's legitimate oppression and use it as their own so they can gain some sort of social currency. You know, so if people were enslaved hundreds of years ago, what the fuck does that have to do with you? <laughs> like that has nothing to do with you. If that's yeah. your claim that you are oppressed because people were enslaved hundreds of years ago, uh, it sounds like you, there's a failure in what you're able to do in yourself in your life. And you're, you're looking to grab onto someone else's, uh, someone else's pain, you know, but it would be like, it'd be like, uh, you know, LeBron James wins the, the championship. And I said, yeah, because we did it. Like you didn't do it. No. <laughs> LeBron did it. Like I, I, I can't dunk like LeBron. LeBron can dunk like LeBron. Uh, I. What kind of person would I be to try to take someone else's accolades or someone else's experience to use it as my own to get some sort of like empathy or praise or whatever? Um, th this is. 
and I don't know if you want to talk about this because I do think it's a real thing. This is part of the racial insecurity that exists amongst Black Americans that I think is unique um, in American culture. There's a level of insecurity. I don't know. Do you do you want to talk more about that? Or? Um, I mean, yeah, if you want. I I don't really understand it fully. I I do know that I've had I've heard people say uh, slavery never ended and uh it, like it's still basically going on today in different forms i do think they're like the, the concept of systemic racism i do feel like exists to at least some degree like there was redlining there was racism up until recent fairly recent decades you know mm -hmm. and that has an effect uh on generational wealth and things like that so there are like differences that are caused by things that happened in the past but I, I think those things are real, but what is the what is the insecurity that you're referring to? So the 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 racial insecurity that I'm referring to, it's a level of I'm trying to think of the best way of putting it. Part of the reason why someone has such strong affinity towards being black. And it's, it's because it fills a void. There, there's an insecurity about themselves and, and they're, they're grabbing onto something that no one else would generally grab onto. You know, I, like I said, I know people from different backgrounds. It's not often that someone holds on to some sort of unearned identity um, unless there's something that is missing. And I think sometimes people do that. Not saying everyone does that. Um, who, who that we're describing, but I do believe that there is a level of insecurity that exists about being black in America, um, that someone feels that they need to have some sort of victim narrative to, as a, as like a, the victim narrative becomes like a reflex for them. Anything that happens to them, they have to go towards that. And it just, to me, it seems like a weakness. Um, it, is, it is a vulnerability and it seems like they're racially insecure about being black. Um, they are like the, the gatekeepers that we were talking about. To me, if a race black and all this, stuff, I'm just talking about the behavior that they're, that they're exhibiting, that's insecure behavior. Um, to try to manipulate people to do the thing that makes you feel the most comfortable is a very insecure act. Um, if you had a partner who acted in this particular way, where they constantly tried to manipulate you to do the thing that they like because it makes them feel better. And it's because they can't handle that you're different. They, no, 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 this can't be possible. You must be just like me. You, we must have the exact same this and that. Only an insecure person would say something like that. Someone who's secure about themselves doesn't care if someone feels this particular way, if someone listens to this music, dates interracially, votes for this particular, they don't care. It doesn't change the fact that they're still black. Yeah. And, and that's the, there's a, for I, what I want more people to, to, to do when it comes to this stuff and what I tried to do within the book, I try to give like a behavioral analysis for all of these different things. If you just look at the behavior of people, you start to see that it's much deeper than black. It's much deeper than white and race. It's deeper than, politics. That's why I think it's very important to talk about, is this manipulation? A race political party, a race, a race, race and all this stuff. Is this manipulation? Because this looks like manipulation. If it's manipulation, I can apply the same narrative to a bunch of different topics. And we would come to the same conclusion that this is manipulation. Is this insecure behavior? If I erase it from race and I put it into a relationship, we would say this is insecure behavior of this person 
who's trying to guilt you, who's trying to shame you into changing your behavior, which isn't, it's not illegal. It's not uh, scandalous. It's not, it's not anything like that. It's just personal taste. And they can't handle that your personal taste is different than theirs. And they're going to attack you and ridicule you to get you to, to switch your personal taste. And it doesn't affect them. <laughs> like, uh, if I decide to vote Republican or not, doesn't personally affect them, but they have to personalize it. Why? Because they're insecure. They're, they're unable for someone to deviate from what they have in their head. Um, and so that's, that's where the racial insecurity comes from. I am, I am racially black and I'm comfortable if someone chooses to vote Republican or Democrat, it is personal taste. I'm comfortable with someone who says, I don't want to date interracially and someone who does want to date interracially or is open to it. I don't care. It doesn't change the fact that I'm black and I make my own personal choices just like everybody else does. Um, so there's, I think we, I think we preach victimhood. I think there's behavioral insecurity that exists amongst these people who claim to be the most sure. It's also, it's often the people who are the loudest are the most insecure. Hmm. Um, you know, just like the bully is the most insecure one of the group. And, and that's what you see. You see the same bullying type of behavior, the gatekeepers who are looking for the person that challenges how they see the world. And so they're going to, they're motivated by that insecurity to either go after this person to big themselves up. Look, look what I was able to do. Look what I did, you know, quote, tweet. No, nah, I told them, look, everybody, give me praise. I need that praise because I can't fill it myself. I'm an insecure individual. Um, or to guilt that person to change what they said um, so they can also gain something from that. Uh, so ultimately, I think in many ways, uh, the examples I'm giving are on the extreme, but I do believe that there, that is the, that's the motivating factor behind it is the insecurity within themselves. Um, because I'm willing to bet it's not just race. Um, mm -hmm. that they're insecure about. I'm, I'm willing to bet it's other things in their life that they're insecure about. I, I can see, a, I, I can understand what you're talking about. And I feel like I see this in the, uh, the red pill community. Uh, yeah. Obviously not with race, but with, with like manliness all the time where people are like, oh, if you, if you cry in front of your girl, you're weak and stuff like that. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I think if you, if you haven't cried in front of your girl, you probably just you don't trust her or you, you haven't experienced a great enough loss, you know? Right. And like, I, I don't think a, a, a woman in a healthy relationship looks down on a man at all for the man crying at appropriate times. Like if you're crying like every second <laughs> about something, then they might start to question some things. But yeah, I, I see that behavior in the, in the red pill community quite a lot. Yeah. Like they have a certain expectation that, they say, this is what a man is. They has to do this and this and this. And it, it really just comes off as insecurity to me. And they're like, oh, you just, you want to tell everyone else what they need to be, to be a man because you don't really feel like a man. That's what the problem is. As, yeah. That's exactly it. Um, there, and I'm, I'm actually glad you brought up the red pill because I, I rarely talk about the red pill publicly because I almost feel like there's no point to yeah. doing so. <laughs> but the, the red pill is, is fascinating in a sense that there is good information that comes from the red pill uh, community. And at least at one point, there was, there were a couple of people that I thought were beneficial um, that sparked conversation. Um, my wife and I would watch some online red pill content and have discussions about it. Um, and, and I think that type of stuff is, is good. I think there are times that we should have conversations about relationships. We should have conversations about the opposite sex um, and discuss these things that are kind of taboo to discuss and maybe the unhealthy behaviors of the opposite sex. Maybe we should talk about these things. But 
And I say this as a consumer. I, I consume all different types of content, including Red Bull content for at least for a couple of years. Um, and I think there is generally good advice that is laced somewhere in there. There was more of it in the beginning when I started consuming it. There was generally good advice. But now it's turned into a clown show of the most insecure guys <laughs> who, <laughs> who are uh, Adam Lane Smith has talked about the red pill and what they're doing. They're teaching men to be avoidant. Um, if she does this, drop her. If she does this, use emotional manipulation. Um, either you're going to do this or it's over. You know, like, uh, you know, leverage stuff. There, there is no expression of love that comes from the red pill. There is no even talking about long-term relationships. It's how to get women, mm -hmm. which is different. Um, and how to get women, yes, is by superficial nonsense, is by having a bunch of money, is, is by all these material things that have nothing to do with your character, right? Go to the gym and lift weights. Why? Not to get healthy, but to get bigger muscles to attract more women. That's how you get women. And it's like, okay, but the men that are consuming this content, what they really want is meaningful relationships. Yeah. That's what they really want. What you're giving them is this is how you bang a bunch of chicks and you'll love it. When in reality, that's not what most men actually desire. They desire a long-term relationship. Um, and there's victimhood also within the red pill. Uh, victimhood culture is all over all over in America. It's weird and fascinating. We're the most privileged society, yet half the people think they're victims of something. No. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually fascinating. Uh, but like in Red Pill, there's victim of the culture. Your failures as a man is their fault. But at the same time, you want to screw the people <laughs> that are making your life harder. It's weird. <laughs> it's yeah. a weird concept that they're trying to sell these men on and in one breath they'll tell them get your money up go to the gym generally good advice nothing groundbreaking but all you're doing all of this to satisfy a woman who is going to take from you and will leave you in an instant because that's what women do so I'm, I'm to improve my life to get with a sociopath. And so I've said this before, the red pill today teaches men how to out sociopath the sociopath. Yeah. That's essentially what they're telling them to do. She's yeah. going to get you. So you need to get her first. So bang her, bang her friends uh, and throw her away like she means nothing. Get her before she gets you. Because if you put a ring on that, she'll leave you in five years and take half your shit. And so that's what we're, that's, that's what they're teaching. They're teaching that you will eventually become the victim of a woman. And so you must become the perpetrator. So you don't become the victim of women. You have to take the, the upper, um, you have to, you have to hit them first. And once again, none of this is about long-term relationships. None of this is really about love. It's about vengeance. Mm -hmm. It's about um, pleasure seeking. It's about taking. Let me just take this. Um, let me trick them into this. But it's never fulfillment. It's never about helping. Really, it's not really about helping. And the men who think that they're getting helped, um, I think... I think there is real grievance that exists out there amongst many men. I know that there are incels out there who are struggling. The problem is that the advice that they're given is hopelessness. So when someone says you're an incel and you, you just can't get anything going. And the guy says, well, the only way you can get laid is by being hot, 
rich uh, or maybe some, some other particular way. And you're like, I'm none of those things, right? I'm not hot. I'm not rich. And I don't have some sort of influence. Like, so I'm just never going to get laid then. I'm never going to have a relationship. Um, so that, I mean, that it's, it's poisonous rhetoric um, that helps, that doesn't help men. What would help men is by not, what would help men is not to pretend that there aren't vicious women that are out there, but it's to tell them how to navigate away from these women because mm. the vast majority of women are not these women. Yeah. Um, and it's not to turn high risk women like online prostitutes into the example of the typical modern woman. Um, Cause what a lot of these people, like I, I've watched so many different shows. We're like, see guys, we just, we just go on the stream. We just ask these girls if they want to come on. Normal women don't want to go on a podcast and talk about their sex life yeah, and talk about the normal women wouldn't do that. They would not put themselves out there. And especially as a guy who has a lot of female friends and I've gotten to understand women much more than I think probably most guys do. Women are way more social, way more uh, careful socially than men are. So no, they don't want to put all their business out. It's a certain type of woman who doesn't mind or who is of a high risk or who's using this as promotion, <laughs> like an OnlyFans girl who would want to go on there and talk about her relationships, and this and that. She doesn't care about any of this stuff. She doesn't care that you call her a whore, but she got her boobs up and she's looking good and she'll shake her butt on camera because she knows that the suckers who, who view this are gonna become OnlyFans subscribers. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just turned into this, this big commodity game. Um, it's not about long-term relationships. It's not about, hey guys, we know that divorce is high, but it doesn't mean that every woman is going to divorce you. You need to know what a healthy woman looks like. Yeah. That that conversation does not exist in the manosphere. There's a podcast, and you might have been thinking about it when you were talking, but there's a podcast that brings OnlyFans models and stuff like that on, on a regular mm -hmm. basis. And they kind of, you know, the I don't know if it'd be a red pill podcast, but they kind of do this thing where they just they give statistics and talk about how bad that lifestyle is. And I'm like, I don't think these conversations are actually worthwhile because you're talking to an extreme of the female population. You're not talking to your average female. You're talking to an extreme. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really resonating. They're just, like you said, seeing it as an advertisement opportunity for themselves. But I, I think that there's value, like you said, in some of the red pill stuff, like toned down like there's value yeah. in understanding your own value and knowing when to walk away from a relationship like if a woman like you shouldn't be degraded you shouldn't feel degraded and belittled by the person you're dating for either sex really so yeah. that's a big thing like you you should know about that but yeah, like where it where it turns to manipulation and things like that like it's taking it way too far and understanding yeah. that there are differences i heard on the trigonometry uh uh, podcast you talking about this like there's differences in men and women how they react to a situation and it made me think of like a conversation my girlfriend's family is over and we were having a conversation last night like we don't have any kids we have two dogs and uh holly was like talking about what happens if somebody breaks in she's like my first thing is i'm gonna go and grab the dogs i'm like i'm grabbing a weapon that's the first thing on my mind if somebody breaks into our house in the middle of the night it mm -hmm. just touches on those differences. Like my opinion, I, my mind is on protecting first. Her mind is on making sure everyone is in the room and, and there different aspects of the same scenario. But I, I think you're right. The red pill movement, it, it has gotten to the point of absurdity and they don't, they don't, focus on connection it's the focus is on getting laid and being the first to screw the other one before the other one screws you and it's like 
yes, there's bad people out there, both sexes. People are going to screw you over at times. That stuff happens. But in general, most people are looking for connection and they're not, they're not wanting. You can't go into a relationship and expect a healthy relationship if if you're just thinking that the other person is there to screw you over and you just yeah. need to do it first. Like <laughs> it, it's just you're not on solid ground, right? It's like it's like starting a business with a business partner that you think is going to screw you in the long run. It's not going to work out. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but I I do think. <laughs> It's just a shame because I know that there's a real issue because, like I said, the red pill has helped me um, in, in many ways, whether it be within my relationship and just having conversations with my wife about these particular things um, or just for me personally to kind of see things in a little bit of a different light um, and to have a little bit more confidence in myself. Um, you know, it was beneficial for me. I just think that the time of being beneficial for men, as far as sound advice, uh, that time is gone and we're in the age of entertainment. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of entertainment surrounding men and women can't get along. Right. Yeah. Um, and we're supposed to have sex with people that don't like us. Uh, <laughs> this is like, it's, it's this weird situation. Um only, only with sex, it's like you, 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 you're, you've convinced yourself that this person does not like me, will use me, will take everything from me, uh, you know, will use my, uh, will use every weakness of mine against me. But I really want them though. <laughs> but I just, I can, I, I gotta yeah. have them. In some way, uh, like it's just, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Uh, in your, uh, well, real quick, I, I think part of what the red pill movement is, is it takes certain aspects of stoicism and mm -hmm. takes them to, again, an absurd extreme. It just, it kind of manipulates those concepts into something that it just wasn't supposed to be in the first place. But I can definitely yeah. see the usefulness in some of it, like toned down a bit, but uh, in your book, you mentioned uh, white privilege and the condescension that uh, yeah. that that has, and I, I find that relatable because, first of all, I don't, and we've talked about this a bit in this conversation. I don't like generalizations. If you're going to mm -hmm. use a concept of like white privilege, I reject the concept, but it doesn't mean that I don't think being white doesn't advantage people in certain situations. Like I definitely think certain people like. There are racists out there and there are situations where race comes into play, whether people know it or not, mm -hmm. uh, whether the people who are affected by it know it or not. And people do gain benefit or not based on their race. So I believe those situations happen. But the concept of white privilege is to me, when I hear that, that's saying, oh, you put a black person, a white person, you can look at the white person, know they had a they have an advantage over the black person just because of their skin color. I just don't believe in a, an assumption that general. And it's interesting because a lot of the rhetoric around uh, white privilege, I feel like if you uh, swap the word privilege out with supremacy, it's basically saying the same thing. Like yeah. a lot of the people that are promoting white privilege, they're kind of promoting white supremacy in a certain way. And it a really, uh, around 2020, there's a guy, uh, he was white and he was, wow, we got in some Facebook argument or conversation and in a private conversation to, you know, he believed in white privilege and to tell me or to get me to believe how non-racist he was. I, I thought it was the most absurd thing he said, he said, I got mugged one time by a black guy and I'm so not racist that I didn't even call the cops on him. And I'm like, dude, so you, you know, other victims were probably black people, right? Like I doubt the guy's <laughs> just mugging white people. <laughs> like he's just an opportunist. Like I doubt he cares about 
what race the person he's mugging is. So I really don't understand how that's benefiting black people if that person goes out and actually victimizes another black person. <laughs> so I just thought of that yeah. and I'm like, yeah. So yeah, I, I would love to, for you to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so white privilege presumes that, like you said, every person who is white is automatically advantaged over someone who is non-white. And so what you're saying is white people are, are superior in society. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what does that sound like? Um, but it, it's white supremacy with a smile, right? It's, you know what? We can't expect for black people to not riot. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it's the most condescending bullshit that you'll ever hear um, coming from and often coming from upper class white people. I like, I just can't, I can't ignore that element that it's, it's not all the time, but it seems like most of the time it comes from this segment of people. And I ask myself, how come it's always like the, the actual people who have like what I, what I would call privilege, economic privilege is the top tier privilege. And not just in America, in any society, the more resources you have, the richer you are. It's been like that since the beginning of time. So like the people who have the most economic privilege are the ones who are saying this stuff. Like I, I'm reminded, I went to um, uh, the Boston area in the suburbs and there's a, there's a guy I was going to interview and he just moved into this this neighborhood, so it's not like he was from there. But he found like this house that he really liked, and he and he he bought it. He moved there. But as I'm driving into this this area, I'm looking at the size of the houses and look nice. And then I'm like, as the houses get nicer, I start seeing stuff. I start seeing BLM trans flag. I start seeing all this stuff. Hate has no home here. And like literally on his block, everyone had a Black Lives Matter flag. You can go into a black neighborhood and you will not see one Black Lives Matter flag whatsoever. And it's it's so it's so strange. It, w it was like a meme. Like it was like mm. I went on Twitter, like I drove into Twitter and I drove into a leftist, <laughs> like, like the leftist version of Twitter. And I, I was like, what is this place? This place is real. And of course, it, it was a very nice upscale neighborhood. And I was like, what, it, what is going on? And I, what I've kind of concluded is that this is taken form as religious dogma of the upper class. Because hmm. um, it's not just the upper class white people who say stuff like this. Um, you know, statistically, there are, more, uh, there are wealth, more wealthy white people than there are any other demographic um, in totality. So maybe it appears that way. But I've heard this from upper class blacks, Asians, you know, so on and so forth. I've heard this stuff that exists. Um, matter of fact, quick side note, I was at a store and this lady was catching attitude with a woman who is, who's black and uh, mixed with something else. She told me later on and she said, what you think, cause I'm Indian, we can't afford this. And I thought to myself, that is the weirdest statement I've ever heard. Because where we live is a high population of Indian people, and they got money. That's the last group of people we think can't afford something. <laughs> <laughs> they're all wealthy. They all got money. Like they're all they're all engineers and shit. Like <laughs> so, it just it was like her trying to construct that she's somehow some sort of victim in that moment, and that's the best thing that she could come up with. Uh, you know, so it it was yeah. So anyways, that's a side note, but it's like, I'm, I'm looking at it. I was like, why, why are all these people doing it? And it just seems like it's just, it's the new religion of the upper class. And so that's why I often say it's the upper class leftist that is saying this stuff the most. Our media is filled with upper class leftists who are saying these things. 
And when you when we talk about it sounds like white supremacy, and then the people who are saying there's systemic racism are the same people, it's almost like they're telling them themselves. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, it's like if Hitler stood up and said, Germany's being controlled by Aryans. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you're talking about you. <laughs> so it's just like, that's where I'm, I'm looking at these people. And that, that's what motivated me to even want to, like, write criticizing the media and what's happening, all these stupid narratives that are coming out. Because they were absent of the reality that most Americans are pretty cool. They're fine. At most, they leave you the fuck alone. Yeah. And the the upper class, uh, dogmatic upper class, who are telling us all this stuff that that most people have concepts they've never heard before, that they heard from their fancy school that they went to, um, and they pay tens of thousands of dollars a year to send their children to these private institutions to to you know to get uh, early indoctrination on. Like they're the ones who are saying these things, but people who actually live in this world, who work a regular job, who are around regular people, interact with people of all different backgrounds all the time. And guess what? We don't have race riots that break out every day, right? Because you know what? That guy is a Knicks fan and so am I. <laughs> like, you know, or Bob, he does a good job at work and he just looks different than me, but me and Bob are cool because we have common interests. We have yeah. shared interests. We're from the same neighborhood. Uh, like the building I live in is like the United Nations. You know, we got white people, Hispanic, uh, black, uh, Muslim, Hindu. You know, we got everybody in this building. And you know what we don't have? Race riots. <laughs> people yeah. fighting in the, in the hallways. People get along. People are cordial. We say hi to each other. We may not like sit down and, and talk to and, you know, talk about our lives with everybody. Because you know we have we're busy and stuff like that, people get along, and that's been my experience from being in majority white neighborhoods, uh, majority white areas, um, or in jobs and things like that, um, or even I, I've had jobs where you know it was majority black and Hispanic. People got along, for the most yeah. part. People got along, and the the times that they didn't get along, it wasn't because of their race. Is because someone's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just plain and simple. Someone is not likable, and yeah. it is just it, they were white, black, or whatever. But they—that's why. And, you know, I've cursed out some people at work, and I cursed them out. I didn't care what they looked like. It, <laughs> like I've cursed out black people and white people at work. Um, not saying that I'm necessarily proud of that, but I felt like it was something I necessarily had to do, and I didn't get fired. No. So. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting with the media because the media does it doesn't give an accurate representation of america like most people right. get along just fine yes there are definitely racists out there and i i definitely don't uh some people believe that you have to be certain races to be racist i reject that completely because if, yeah, if race stupid. is real anyone can be a race <laughs> because anyone can hate another person based on the superficial characteristic but the media does the they're, they're constantly pushing racial narratives and it, it mm -hmm. is really interesting i don't know if it's just for for the clicks they get or if it's i mean i know you don't believe in conspiracy in general so it's probably not to push some bigger conspiracy but uh i mean you do mention in your book that politicians and politicians do collude with the media it is easier to control populations when you have them fighting. So I definitely yeah. think there is that. But in general, I think, you know, whether you're Republican, Democrat, independent, like there's racists in all those groups probably, but they're mostly a small fraction. And even, even then it's like, I think behaviors can be racist unintentionally. I think people do racist things or say racist things more likely occasionally mm -hmm. and they don't i don't necessarily consider people that do racist things racist because racist is somebody who like that's what they are or somebody 
who's not necessarily racist can do something that is racist in a situation or can be perceived as racist in a situation. Like I hear, yeah, I hear people do little things like actually one, somebody I'm in Utah in my district, there was a, a black Congresswoman named Mia Love. And one of my liberal friends was talking to me or left leaning friends, liberal left. I don't know. My left leaning friend, he was saying, Oh, Republicans would never let a a black person into Congress or something like that or into any kind of position. I'm like, well, Mia Love was, I mean, she was out of office at that time, but she was just representing my district. And he said, oh, well, Republicans love their token blacks. And I'm like, it's a, seems a little racist <laughs> of a statement right there. And that reminded me of the the French woman you talked about in your book, what she said to you, where it's like, she uses the N word toward you. And in her head, she's just thinking that she's quoting a Republican, but it's like, no, that's you using that word. It's not just quoting. Well, so, just a yeah. slight clarification. So the, the French woman didn't say that it was a, I was having a conversation oh. with the French woman. It was an American doctor. Oh, who gotcha, came in. Gotcha. okay. Sorry, yeah. They, so that's why, that's why it was profound to me. If the French mm -hmm. woman said it, I could easily dismiss it as like, she doesn't get it. Like it's a cultural thing that she doesn't yeah, understand. Yeah. Like, oh, that that's an offensive word or something like that. Um, and, and depending on the intent, she didn't mean it in that particular way. But it was the American doctor who is mm. from America and understands the American context with the stuff and things that you you. It's generally not a good thing <laughs> to yeah. go up to black people and passively uh or anything like that because you don't know me so you don't know if i'm going to just you know turn red if i hear the n-word yeah. from a white person um but the the uh, I, I just thought it was a weird audacity that she felt comfortable saying that to me and she doesn't know me um mm -hmm. and to impl to imply that to republicans in general, and keep in mind, at the time, I would have called myself a Democrat, but I felt that that was very strange and that was, I was off-putting for her. So as she's like giving me a compliment, because she she's listening to what I'm saying, she thinks I'm being politically astute. She's she's trying she's finding some way to smear Republicans by using my race. Which throughout the entire time, I don't think I really wrote this, but like throughout the entire dialogue that we're discussing politics, we're discussing politics. We're not talking about race. You know, at no point was I like, and Republicans are racist, right? I mean, we all know that they're racist. Then it would be a different story. But she felt the need to bring race into, the, into a political conversation mm -hmm. when I wasn't talking about race. We were talking about politics and policies and things like that. You know, the things that we used to do. <laughs> yeah. But um, so that's that's even more of I was like, that's why, like, it sticks in my head. I'm like, why the F does she just say that? And she felt comfortable. Like, I just I brush it aside and and she's like, yeah, right. You know, they see you as it. And I'm like. All right. Well, yeah, this is nice meeting you, <laughs> lady. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's, you're absolutely right. Like when your friend says they like their token blacks, when the sentence before they would never bring a black person, <laughs> it's like, which yeah. side is it? Yeah. <laughs> Cause even, even with the, them trying to say that they, they speak on both sides of their mouth. Um, but yes, it is very much so. The, the token black thing is even more so a validation that there is one way to approach this as a black person. Yeah. And that if you deviate, it's because you're being used as some sort of token. You're, you're perfectly fine with being used. You don't really believe these things. Like that's part of the shaming language. You're just saying this because they're paying you. You're just saying this because this. You're just, it's never how you genuinely feel. 
uh, or how you were raised, or I've thought about this consciously, and this is why, and I disagree with this because of this and that. No, like you're doing this for nefarious reasons. Um, you're going against your interests. How do you know what my interests are? Well, mm -hmm. because you're black, of course. Oh, that's right. So automatically, you know what my interests are and what I care about. So everything, that type of language, token black, um, black community, all this other stuff, it is designed to remove the individual. And so I'm not to say that there aren't groups that exist. Obviously, there are groups that exist. There are cultural overlaps that exist, yes. But I do not determine the exact person's interests based off of their group. That's yeah. stupid. Um, you know, and it's one thing to be like, Italians like pasta. Okay, well, that's a, that's a cultural commonality. It's another thing if I was like, I expect all Italians to vote Republican. <laughs> it's like, <Yeah>. fuck, <laughs> like, what, what does that have to do with anything about being Italian? But that's the level of expectation, culturally speaking, um, in America, when it comes to being black, everyone expects you to behave a particular way. And if you deviate, um, either someone is paying you, um, or you just you like being the the ultra minority. Um, you feel more comfortable around all these other white people, and they'll also talk on both sides of their mouth when they say, "Look at this picture with all these Republicans. It's nothing but white men." I was like, "But you just said that black people can't be Republicans, and then if they do, that they're coons and and tokens." <laughs> so if they try to, and then if they show a picture where there are some, look at that black person, why are they there? But you were just complaining that there aren't any there. So which one is it? Do you want more black people to become Republicans to prove a point? Or do you want them to be less black Republicans to prove a point? Which one do you actually want? Um, and at the end of the day, that this is, this is just sport language. When they do stuff like this, they just want to find some sort of way to go after Republicans, which trust me, as, as someone who is not a Republican, there are plenty of things you can go after Republicans about uh, <laughs> that have nothing to do with race. Yeah. Um, but this, is, this has become the most convenient um, line of attack. But I, I will say that, <sighs> obviously, there, no political party has a monopoly on racists. The vast right. majority of people who are Republican conservative, I would not classify as racist um, or, or even wanting to be racial. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've dealt with uh, racists who are, who are Republicans, but I wouldn't say that they're all this way at all, without a doubt. And I, I can say that as someone who's interacted with a ton of Republicans and, and I understand their mindset and what their, what their objective is. And I would say the same thing about Democrats too. I don't think the majority of Democrats are racist or uh, white supremacists or far leftists or anything like that. I think they're being pragmatic about their vote and they, they, they have their reason as to why they're choosing to vote for one particular party. We have two parties essentially. We have two parties to choose from in any given election. Yeah. And so the idea that, <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've, I haven't really written about this, but we often think that the, the reason why you wouldn't vote for that party is the same reason why someone is voting for that party. So if you're a Republican, you say, I could never vote Democrat because they're okay with uh, abortion. So the person that is voting Democrat is voting because of abortion. It's like, no, everyone has the reason. For that person, abortion doesn't even hit their top 10. They don't give a shit about abortion. They care about these other things. And the Democrats fill that for them. Or it's yeah. just cultural. Their parents vote Democrat. They vote Democrat. That's all they know. This is voting Democrat. And everyone just presumes that the party that they happen to vote for, and we have two choices in this country, essentially, the party that they're voting for is out of this 
blind love and you know just like complete fulfillment every time i vote blue like it's just like that's not that's not what people are doing people are just pragmatic and they vote for the thing that seems the most familiar with them that and if they are issue oriented there maybe is like one or two top issues for them and one particular party fulfills that for them or they believe will fulfill that for them yeah um you know it's it's so so much more complicated than people make it seem. Um, in the same way, you know, if I go out and vote for Trump, doesn't mean that I'm a Trump supporter. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm going to his rallies, I'm wearing the hat. I'm just being pragmatic about my vote. Uh, you know, I think Trump is a better option than Kamala. Um, but it doesn't mean I love Trump. I think he's flawed. I, you know, I've written articles for, and, and this is the other great thing about writing publicly. Uh, so when people do try to come after you, call you a Trump supporter, I can tell them a year ago, I wrote in the New York Post that DeSantis is a better option than Trump and that Trump, <laughs> Trump should step aside. So you can't call me a Trump loving, you know, Trump supporter. I, I thought the man shouldn't even run for president again. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's in many ways, I don't like how we discuss politics uh, these days. I think it is very much so team this, team that. Everyone just sees what they want to see. No one's actually discussing policy. And last thing I'll say, because I know I've been talking for a minute, but like this is like the fundamental problem that I have with Kamala Harris making it as far as she has. Kamala Harris barely has to talk about policy. She just has to give the vibe that she knows what she's doing. Yeah. And makes you feel good. I just feel like she would be a good president. I don't know. I don't know what, what she'll do. Like, could you just imagine if you had like HR managers who are just hiring people based off of, I don't know, they didn't answer any of my questions, but I just feel like they would do a good job as supervisor at this company. Like yeah. we wouldn't do that, but the person, <laughs> the person who's supposed to be the most powerful person in the world, uh, you know, so to speak, we're just, cause it feels good. And I'm just like, that's not enough for me. You got to give me, you got to give me something. And I can't, I can't choose someone off of vibes. Um, I need, I need something to, you know, to give my vote for you to get this position. Yeah. I feel like a lot of what you touched on uh, comes down to intent when it comes to conversations. Like we always, yeah. I mean, not we, but like a lot of people when it comes to politics or anything that kind of tangentially, chan, tangentially touches on politics, they want to assume intent. So it's like, mm -hmm. oh no, if you're doing this, it's because of this. Whatever you say doesn't matter. I know, I know why you're really doing it. I know why Trump really does this. I know why Kamala really says this. I know why this person is acting this way. When we really don't, like, if you go into a courtroom, intent is one of the hardest things to uh, prove because you have to actually have someone spell it out premeditated to know exactly what their intent was. And even then there's still, you know, people can lie about their intent. So intent yep. is extremely hard to prove in, in a court system. And we really don't know what's anyone's in anyone's heads. That's what intent is. It's what's in somebody else's head, but in current politics, a lot of the conversation revolves around knowing what the person you disagree with, which makes it even more unlikely that you know what's in their head, but mm -hmm. knowing what's in the other person's head. I know, I know what's really going on. I know what this person's really after. I know what you're really yeah. going after here. It's all about intent. Yeah. Anyone that says that they know exactly without having access um, is full of shit. <laughs> like just plain and simple full of shit. Um, I've talked about this with friends of mine who are part of media uh, in, in kind of in this sphere. We, and I'll, I'll include you into this as well. We are privileged in this dialogue because we have access and a lot of people don't. I mean, that's just what it is. Uh, you know, Bob down the street who works at a retail outlet doesn't have access to a politician or, or to a former candidate. Uh, um, 
you know, in many ways, when you get in this space, at least uh, I'll, I'll just speak for myself, getting into the space has allowed me access to people to understand them better. So I'll, I'll use a, a good example, Vivek Ramaswamy. I, I met him because we were speaking at, a, at the same uh, place and I didn't really, I didn't know who he was. And other people were like, who's this, who's this guy? He had just uh, written this book. And I think he had just start, stepped down from his company a CEO, um, heard him speak, very impressive guy, mm -hmm. talked with him, um, probably, and I'll still say to this day, the most impressive guy you'll meet in person, without, without a doubt. And I gave him, uh, he saw the, the title of my book, and he's like, hey, I'm about to write a book about victimhood. Can you send me a copy of the book? So I shipped him a copy of the book. About a year later, I didn't hear from him a year later. I happened to see him at America Fest, just like crossing the street. He's like, hey, Adam. I was like, oh, shit. What's up, Vivek? He's like, hey, I wanted you to know that your book wasn't used in vain. Um, I actually quoted it in my book. Hmm. So I just wanted to thank you. I was like, oh, shit. No problem. Um, and I, I picked up a copy and I saw the, the parts that he quoted. Then he decided to run for president. And he started his podcast and I was one of, I think I was like of the, one of the first like five people that he wanted to sit down with. And it was the first time we had like a really like long conversation to understand each other. And from there we exchanged information. And what's very interesting about my podcast with him was that I had so many people who were interested and Vivek, because he was like an enigma to them. He was this guy whose name is popping up all over, but they don't know much about him. And I became like this Vivek whisperer. But what ultimately what people were trying to find out is what's his character and what's his intention? And so I think just even from me having a two hour conversation with him on camera, uh, conversations with him off camera, exchanging of numbers to so occasionally talk to each other. And then to add it on top of that, the, the many people that I would come across who knew him on an even more personal level, who did nothing but scream his praises and like gave me real examples. Like he wanted to hire this one guy to work, um, to work with him, but the guy lived in a, in a different state. And he's like, listen, I live in a different state. I got my family here. He said, no problem. Vivek paid for him to not only come down there, but to bring his entire family and pay for his family to stay somewhere just mm -hmm. so he can come there. Because he, he, he said, family comes first. And he's like, people don't do that. Like he emphasized, people don't do that. They don't pay for you to move and bring your entire family and take care of the place that you're staying at just so you can work for them. But he did that. And he's not, he's been nothing but a gracious person. So, and he's been nothing but polite to me and gracious to me. And that tells me that his character, he has a good character and he means well. Um, in that podcast episode, there was a situation where he got a lot of backlash and it was something racial. And he's like, I didn't realize that this is how it sounded. When I broke it down to him, I was like, this is why people reacted the way that they did. And he felt bad. So he brought up his flaw on camera to discuss like the reaction to it, that it existed and what he, what he could have done different. And to me, that takes someone a strong character to even acknowledge publicly. Like we have politicians who pretend that they never said the thing that they said, yeah. <laughs> you know, and never apologize or anything like that. To, and for him to have the humility to be like, I mean, I messed up, you know, and he didn't have to, he could have just, you know, and moved on, but he wanted to have that conversation with me and talk to me about it. And, and he was open to hearing what I had to say. Um, so I think that that access to him allows for me to understand his character, his intent, and then access to the, the people who are in his orbit as well to understand what he is like as a person. So then if I see him say something or do something, I know where 
the base of it is coming from. But if you don't have access to that information, all you're doing is presuming off of the limited information that you have or your own biases or, or whatever um, that makes you feel good. And so I think that's, it, I think it's a normal thing. You can't have access to everybody, but it's just, it's really difficult to try to make everything about intent, uh, to make it be like, they're saying this or doing this because they want this. And it's like, well, you don't actually know that. What, what the thing that people can do is behavioral analysis. They can do that. Um, they can look at historical references and historical points where they said one thing this day and did a different thing the next day. You can at least call them a hypocrite because of stuff like that. Yeah. But their, their intention, like what's their motivation? Um, and even if they get on camera and say that their intention is this, you'll be like, they're a liar. So like even the person, <laughs> they, can't, they can't even explain what their intention is because someone will be there. Well, obviously they're lying. They don't, they don't really mean that. What they really mean is this. Um, so at the end of the day, it comes down to whether someone has good or bad faith understanding or uh, curiosity about a given person that they're talking about in politics. And most people don't. Um, and for me, the, the biggest reason why I tell people I'm independent and I remain an independent um, is it allows me the freedom to see what I see and analyze it the way I analyze it and not play group politics. So if I do criticize Trump, you can't be shocked. If I criticize Kamala, you can't be shocked. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think there are way more independents than people realize. It's just that the hyper partisans think like, no, you're just sitting on the fence. You need to pick a side. You know, it's just like, <laughs> like it's like we really are playing a team sport. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I I try to be pretty nuanced, and I've I've been told that by that. By people like you have to pick a side and like i'm not I'm, i have my morals i know where i stand on things but right. having a nuanced conversation and criticizing what i see wrong on either side that doesn't make me like a necessarily a fence sitter or anything like that it reminds me my friend's uh girlfriend recently told me uh, she feels disenfranchised with uh the democratic party for various reasons uh, she's still, I'm um, sure, voting for the right or the left because she's very much against the right. But she told mm -hmm. me she doesn't feel like she has a, a political identity anymore. And I was like, that sounds like a good thing to me. Like, I don't think we should <laughs> identify. I don't think it's a good to identify with politics, like identify, like play the team sport and all that stuff. I don't think it's good. I think we should be. I'd rather see more people independent and then say, oh, I'm just going to analyze each is issue as I see it rather than I'm on this team. I'll just support whatever they say. I, I just don't think it's I don't think it's good in general for that. So I don't I don't think it's good and I don't think it works in the long term, especially for like the type of stuff that I do. Yeah. Um, which political commentary, because I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it where the person who's like, I'm MAGA, I'm a Republican, ah. And then they're like, yeah, uh, we shouldn't do that, guys. And they go after them. You're a rhino, you're this, you're that. And you know what? They never bring it up again. Yeah. You know, and they they like, because I've, I've said this before, that people, <laughs> there's a reason why the punishment for treason is the death penalty. Um, people always go harder after someone that they think is committing treason versus someone that they know is an enemy. Um, so they, they go super, super hard after someone who is within their circle, within their orbit that is supposedly on their team and who portrayed, uh, uh, they'll try to frame as like portraying them by taking a varying viewpoint. Um, you know, and that's political ideologues do do shit like that all the time. 
And but what that ends up doing is basically force you to comply. So like if you criticize Trump one time, yet you were wearing the MAGA hat, like you can't, what are you doing? You sound like you must be really a Democrat in disguise. Blah, blah, blah. Like it just becomes this whole big thing because, oh, dear God, you criticized the man one time because he did something that was, I don't know, probably worth criticizing because um, you're just having a political discussion. Then it just becomes this whole big thing. So that's why I don't I don't like the titles. Um, people call me whatever they want as far as black conservative. I don't correct anybody. They're going to call me whatever they're going to call me. But I don't think I've ever publicly stated that I'm a, a conservative. Um, I personally think that I am, I think I'm left leaning on certain things and right leaning on other things. Um, so for example, I don't care if gay people get married. I just don't. Um, marriage is through the state. Don't care. But I respect if, if a church, a religious institution says, sorry, it's against our religion to marry a same sex couple. I respect that. You know, I respect their, their religious freedom to not want to do that in their institution. But I, if they want to go to a courthouse and get married because they want to make sure that the person that they love is taken care of with their insurance, and, you know, just like any other other uh, couple decides to, then I have no problem with that. Who cares? That's, that's the thing between them and the state. Um, you know, but I am uh, against abortion. You know, so it just really depends on what the thing is. Yeah. Um, but there, there are many things I do not agree with on, uh, when it comes to conservatives. Um, there are things I don't agree with when it comes to libertarians. Um, and there are things I don't agree with when it comes to, uh, liberals and, and certain liberals and Democrats. So I don't, I don't even know what <laughs> the political spectrum has shifted so many times. I don't know where the hell I stand. And honestly, I, I don't even care anymore. Yeah. I'm with you. I mean, people can label, people can label me, but and people can label anybody, but you don't have to accept somebody's label just because they label you. Like people yeah. can try to categorize you, but it doesn't mean you have to accept it. So well, exactly. Adam, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do like to ask people that I talk to about books. Um, you mm -hmm. being an author, I know obviously you recommend your book and people should read it, but are there any books that have really influenced you in your life? Yeah, so I will say this, and just being completely transparent, um, I'm more of an audiobook person. Okay. Um, there is a book that I've been recommending to people. It's called uh, Imagine the God of Light um, by John Burke. And it talks about near death experiences. Um, and, and so people understand uh, in July this year, I was baptized. Hmm. Um, now I, I proclaimed Christ as my savior well before I got baptized. Um, but I was finally found the right moment, time and place where my family can, can be there for me to get baptized. So it, it took me a little bit of time to do it. Um, but I'm, I'm a new Christian. I'm recently saved. Um, but what this book was helpful for me to understand a couple of things, relationship with God as a personal relationship, um, like as a, as a loving relationship. And I think often people who are, who are Christian or want or are interested in becoming Christians, see everything through the church. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine today who is interested in Christianity and trying to find something. And they're worried about if I go to this church and I don't fit in and I explain to them, the church is not supposed to be the intermediary to God. It's, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship that you're having with God, so, which is why prayer is incredibly important. And that book really helped me to kind of understand that, that deep personal relationship by using the stories of people who had near-death experiences. Um, 
and John, a little bit of history with him. John was agnostic for many years. He was an engineer and now he's a pastor in Texas. Um, and the near death experiences was like one of the biggest driving forces of evidence for him to bring him towards Christianity. Um, and over the decades, because he's been doing research and conducting interviews with people who had near-death experiences from all over the world, so not just the United States, from all over the world. And what he basically summarizes is that the near the the afterlife experiences, not everyone is the same. There, there are things that do overlap that are common, but they're not all exactly the same, which gives them more legitimacy. Um but from a religious standpoint, no matter where they're from, no matter their familiarity with Christianity, no matter if they're atheists or not, um, no matter if they're from some remote area in India or and they have no familiar familiarity with Christianity or even understand anything, their depiction of the afterlife matches the depiction of the Christian faith. Hmm. Um, and he tells these different stories throughout the book, um, stories of people who are Muslim, who are Buddhists, who have no understanding as far as Christianity and Christian faith or anything like that. Uh, there's one particular story of this woman. Uh, she, I think she was Muslim, but she's of like a, a particular sect where in the afterlife they see like 13 of something. And so when she passed, she thought she was going to see that and she didn't. Uh, she saw this man, and in the in in the spiritual realm, you have instant knowledge. And so, when she saw this man, she immediately knew it was Jesus Christ. Hmm. Now, she's not she's not from the states. She's not familiar with Christianity or anything like that. But she instantly knew who he was and his significance, and she knew the truth. So, when she came back, now she's back in her society where everyone is a Muslim who does not believe in Jesus Christ as the savior, who does not understand these things. And she had a crisis, <laughs> you know, she didn't know what to do because now she has to live her life with this truth and, and, and this understanding. I mean, there, I think near death experiences are the most profound and underrated experiences in our society because And, and throughout the book, he he outlines, you know, the skepticism of near-death experiences. You can attack one thing, but when one near-death experience has 10 different things, how do you explain them, right? And usually what happens is people try to criticize and say, well, what about this? It's like, okay, but then what about the nine other things that are part of the same story? How do you explain that? Yeah. Um, so how do you explain someone who is dead? Because I've, I've heard people, they often say, well, what if they're, what if the body does this thing when you're dying? And it's like, but that's not what happened. They're dead. That There's no electricity in the brain. There's no memories to be generated. There's no visions to be had. They're dead. Not only are they dead, where there are situations where they're dead for 15 minutes. Uh, I was watching this one near death experience. This guy was dead so long that they transported his body to another hospital and he came back. And no one can explain how this man came back because I think he said he was dead for almost an hour. Hmm. It, this, this sounds like miracle level stuff. No doctor can explain as to why this happened. And the thing that's most profound about near-death experiences is that the experience of being dead is verifiable. So it's a lot different if I said, I saw Jesus, right? You have to take my word for it. But if I said, I went to the hospital and I was dead, I got hospital records that can show that I was yeah. dead. We yeah. can verify this information. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is... Um, about this book, because he, he he gives all these different arguments using the interviews and stories that he's conducted over the years. Um, but there's one particular story where this woman 
died on the operating table, floated above her body. And um, as she was floating above her body to have this experience, she saw on top of the, the operating lamp, you know, this big light on her body. She floated above the lamp and saw that there was a red sticker on the lamp. She has her experience. She eventually comes back into her body and she's trying to tell the nurse what happened and they, they don't believe her. And so she says, there's a red sticker on the top of the lamp. Go and check. I, I had that experience. They check. There's a red sticker on top of the lamp. Hmm. So he uses that. He says, there are many stories that are like this that are verifiable uh, where they hear, they hear conversations that other people are having in a different room or in a different country. Um, and they have verified, you were wearing this, you were talking about this and their family members are like, that's creepy as shit. How the fuck did you know that? Yeah. Like, so there, it, it's just, you, you, you attack one thing, but you have all these different examples that are aligned with it. Um, so if at, at the very least, what, what near death experiences tell me, if you want to remove religion from it, fine. But when, when near death experiences tell me is that there is something. And I think a lot of people just struggle to understand that there is something. And a lot of people are, are trying to search to figure out um, how do they live their life now? Because they believe that once my heart stops, that's it. I'm just food for the earth. But there is something more. And I think people are kind of struggling with that. And I think near-death experiences are like the stories that people, we talk, people say like in the Bible, there's all these miracles. And I'm like, in my head, near-death experiences are the miracle stories. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the thing that we, what do they say? There's nothing more um, certain than death and taxes, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yet here this person dies. There's no, there's no, um, there's no pulse. There's no electrical activity in their brain. They're dead. They're clinically dead. And then they come back minutes later, 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later. And then they tell me this profound experience. That's so profound for them that they changed their lives. Like that's, that's not a dream. It, it's, it's so profound that it's clear. It's not uh, like when I have a dream, it's kind of me, but it's not me. And I think I see my wife, but it doesn't look like my wife. Like it is very much so clear is very certain and distinct hmm. as to what they're experiencing. And it's like, these are the stories. And there are people who say that they see Jesus Christ and he tells them to tell their story. Um, so I just, I just think that that book that, um, granted I listened to the audio book, but that book and the stories that he tells are so deep and meaningful and memorable and the arguments that he makes but with using these stories makes so much sense to me that I don't, I don't understand how someone can listen to this and hear what he's saying and not take something away from that. Um, so that's that's the book I would I would recommend that someone give it either the audiobook a listen or or buy the the physical copy. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely check that one out. Um yeah. well, Adam, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Before we wrap up, I wanna hand it over to you to just tell listeners where they can find you on social media, your website, Substack, um, and then also where they can find your book and then anything else you feel like sharing. Yeah. Um my Substack adambcoleman.substack.com. Uh, I try to put personal stories, personal, um, deep, meaningful things and updates on, you know, appearances and things like that on my Substack. Uh, so people who want to follow the things that I'm working on. Um, uh, I'm the most active on Twitter at wrong underscore speak. And I also have a YouTube channel where I conduct um, sit down conversations um, over a meal called Breaking Bread. 
uh, and that's uh, youtube.com slash at wrong underscore speak. Awesome. Adam, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.